John Kappelman served on the EMP Commission staff as a senior researcher on geomagnetic storms, EMP, and their disruptive effects on the national electric grid. He served as a principal investigator for FEMA, examining the EMP threat from geomagnetic storms to electric power systems. Kappenman was a principal contributor to a recent study by the National Academy of Sciences on the EMP threat from geomagnetic storms. I would add that Kappenman's work on geomagnetic storms for the EMP Commission was pioneering, groundbreaking work for the EMP Commission, in effect, discovered this new threat, the threat of a great geomagnetic storm that could have catastrophic consequences for our society. I'm going to get a little bit techy in order to describe to you a bit of the similarities of geomagnetic storms and also why power grids are vulnerable uh, and at what levels. One of the first things I want to point out is that uh, an EMP event and a geomagnetic storm event are similar in important ways. For the EMP event, there's a fast pulse, which is called the E1 pulse. That is not really produced by a geomagnetic storm. It is rather the E3 pulse, which is a slow pulse, which has amazing similarities to the natural environment produced by a geomagnetic storm. And it will be primarily this aspect of E3 portion of EMP and geomagnetic storm impacts the impulsive disturbances from those, which can really be almost interchanged as I go through this talk. Space weather is the common term that's used to describe activity caused by the sun and disturbances in the near-Earth space environment. Geomagnetic storms is just one aspect of uh, space weather. And as I'll focus on my talk here, it will be geomagnetic storms and impacts on the U.S. power grid. U.S. power grid, of course, is a, a very important infrastructure. It is a keystone infrastructure. You remove that, essentially, you'll lose most other infrastructures either immediately or within a short period of time. As Peter mentioned, quite a bit of work has been done, not only by the EMP Commission, by but by other uh, highly focused uh, investigative efforts uh, involving myself and other uh, uh, key experts in this area. Let me just walk you through from the sun to the earth and the power grids on North America in particular, how a geomagnetic storm results and what it can do to the function of the U.S. infrastructure. We've all heard of the sunspot cycle, solar cycles, 11-year variations in solar activity. Some are large, some are small. The largest one that we know of over only about 200 years of good data available to us is cycle 19, which occurred in the late 1950s, early 1960s, essentially about the same time we just started developing the high voltage power grid uh, that exists in this country right now. What I'm showing you here is the occurrence of particularly large geomagnetic storms over that period of time. You'll see in cycle 19 there was a lot of very interesting geomagnetic storms, all of them predating the space age, all of them essentially predating today's modern power grid infrastructure. There was an important storm in March 13, 1989 that served as a real wake-up call to the electric power industry. I began researching the importance of geomagnetic storms in 1977, and a lot of that research fell on very deaf ears to the power industry up until that event in March 1989 when uh, it was demonstrated that uh, these had the potential to cause blackouts uh, to the power grid, something that we had predicted in the... Uh, uh, late 1970s. Another thing I'm pointing out here is a storm, an important storm that occurred in 1986. Notice it is at the absolute minimum between the uh, peaks of the sunspot cycles. In other words, it only takes one very active region on the sun to produce a geomagnetic storm. Therefore, a lot of the focus has unfortunately and inappropriately been focused on, well, we need to be prepared for the peak of a sunspot cycle. 
Uh, in actuality, large storms can and do occur at any time during the sunspot cycle. They're almost as probable of occurring in uh, the next month as they are in the upcoming peak of the next solar cycle, which will be around 2012, 2013. This is a uh, brief animation here showing you about a week of sunspot activity on the surface of the sun. This occurred near the peak of the last solar cycle. Each of those dark regions is a sunspot or what we also call an active region. Now some of these active regions can be quite quiet and benign. Some can be extraordinarily violent in producing large flare events nearly every day or so. It is the violent active regions that we are particularly concerned about, especially when those active regions are near the center of the solar disk, that they can direct a coronal mass ejection out into interplanetary space. The faint light around the sun, we've used a coronagraph instrument here to block out the bright light of the sun, and now you're seeing essentially just large coronal mass ejections, plasma from the uh, sun itself, it injected out into interplanetary space. This was for about a two-week period, and you could see there was continuous activity uh, during that two-week period. Many of those CMEs going harmlessly out into interplanetary space, if they happen to be directed towards us at the Earth, you would essentially see a brightening all the way around, uh, essentially what we call a halo CME, uh, and you're in effect like looking down the barrel of the shotgun. This is an animation of the geomagnetic storm on March 13, 1989. What you see there is a sudden onset of that geomagnetic storm along the U.S.-Canada border. These are the power system impacts that were observed coincident with that intensification of that geomagnetic storm. You'll notice that the province of Quebec went from normal conditions to complete province-wide blackout in 92 seconds. Also a little note in the bottom there, the intensity of this particular uh, storm that took down the Quebec grid was only 480 nanotesla per minute. That's the rate of change of the geomagnetic field. In other words, the rate of change of a geomagnetic field induces a current uh, flow, a Faraday effect, in the underlying uh, power grid and uh, Earth infrastructure. Later on that day, an even more broad-based and intense substorm occurred. And you can see that it's now well down into mid-latitude regions of the North American continent and spans across the U.S. power grid infrastructure. It had impacts that essentially ranged from coast to coast here. All of these red blocks here were indicating significant power system anomalies and events that were associated with that geomagnetic storm, all happening within a short period of time. NERC and uh, power industry officials uh, uh, estimated that we came uncomfortably close to a blackout that realistically could have extended from the mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. all the way through the Pacific uh, Northwest uh, from this uh, disturbance. The intensity of this particular disturbance generally topped out at about 300 nanotesla per minute. Large key assets, especially transformers, there is a potential for permanent damage to these important assets, and they can occur over relatively short periods of time. This particular transformer was a large nuclear plant generator step-up unit transformer in Salem, New Jersey, and it was damaged by just that one storm. This is actual large copper windings that have melted through inside that transformer. The uh, problem, of course, is that uh, manufacturing is a very long lead time for items like this. Uh, Meditech did a, uh, a market analysis of uh, large transformers back in January of 2008. At that time, if you wanted a new transformer of this uh, sort of design, you were talking about a three-year backlog uh, from ordering to uh, delivery of the uh, device. And it will be these sort of assets within the power grid that essentially act to cripple the power grid. And I'll show you in a few slides here how many of these assets could be vulnerable for a large geomagnetic storm. 